clock, so I'm going to go ahead and start the first presentation. All right, so uh, my name is Anita He. I am currently a senior product designer at Unity, and today I'm here to talk to you about navigating your early years in the industry. So just out of curiosity, how many people here have been working for like three years or less, if you could raise your hand. Okay, okay, so some, some of you. Um, are any of you still studying or looking? Okay, cool, cool, all right. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm here today because uh, school is great or you know internships are great, but it really is just a tutorial. It doesn't tell you a lot of things that you really should know before you go. So the first couple years in the industry, I think is quite uh, scary. <laughs> so uh, I've compiled a, uh, four talking points and under each section there's four points as well, so easy to remember four and four. And this is based on very wise words I've heard from mentors and colleagues as well as what I've observed uh, in people my age as well as my own personal experience of course. So. Uh, we'll be talking about one opportunities. So how do you find it? How do you pursue it? How do you give yourself permission to do it? Uh, two, people. Uh, people are very important. Three, one-on-ones. Uh, how to do it right because no one <laughs> tells you anything about how to do one-on-ones um, before you enter the workforce. And lastly, uh, how to create a sustainable system and rhythm for yourself. is not working. All right, so uh, about me, I have a background in game design. Uh, I went to a fancy art school for it. I graduated in 2020, which is, as we all know, the best time to graduate. Um, and I'm currently working as a senior product designer at Unity. So for those of you who don't know, Unity is a game engine. So uh, a lot of people use it to create games. And um, a product designer is in Unity is just like a glorified UX designer. Um, and in my free time, I volunteer also as the operations director for Friendship Garden, which is a nonprofit that helps marginalize and underrepresented devs in the game industry. Uh, the organization is currently on a short hiatus, but check us out next year. We usually have scholarships to go to GDC, uh, the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco. So. Uh, this is my friend Falash. She has another version of this talk on her website. If anyone's interested, it's falashaziv.com. Uh, we were supposed to do this talk together, but she couldn't make it. So if you want to hear another perspective uh, or another take on the subject, you could find it on her website. So all right, uh, opportunities. Um, I think opportunities, you, you hear about it a lot, right? Like, oh, you should be uh, chasing opportunities, starting initiatives, do things to stand out, but I think finding the right opportunity to initiate in your workplace is very similar to how I think the process goes for when you actually determine whether or not you should be producing a product or you should be developing a feature, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is a very UX designer uh, bias mindset, but I think, uh, when you start from people's pain points is usually when it goes rather smoothly. So uh, what I found to be effective is instead of waiting for things to come up and just volunteering for it, uh, listen, listen closely to the people around you. What are they saying? What are they complaining about? What is something that would bring value that no one is doing because everyone's busy and they don't have the time? And that's usually where the opportunities lie. Um, once you've identified something, the next step is to overcome your imposter syndrome. So everyone has imposter syndrome. It's a well-known thing in this industry. But I think you have it worse when you are just starting <laughs> because you're surrounded by people who have been in the industry for like 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, some, have been, some of them have been working for longer than you've been alive. So it's very, it's very hard to feel like you can take the lead and do something when like those people aren't doing it. But I think it's important to remember that 
companies aren't charities. Uh, they're, they're gonna hire you out of pity. You're there for a reason. Um, and you might not have the perspective of someone who's been working for 20 years, but you do have the perspective of someone who's fresh to the industry, who doesn't come with biases of how things should be done. And usually that's where innovations come from, and that's why they hired you. So. Uh, once you have given yourself the permission to actually take an initiative, um, you don't need to start it off by you know, getting out your megaphone and announcing it to the whole company and taking this huge commitment and announcement to be like, hey, I'm gonna do this. Um, you can start it slowly. It can be a soft launch. So you know, like talk to your peers, get their opinion of how they feel about your ideas, uh, make a soft, launch proposal to your uh, manager and see what they think. Um, you're not alone and you don't have to do it alone. And uh, at the end of the day, I think when you are earlier in your career, it's the good time to take these risks because, uh, not because um, if you fail it hurts any less than if you fail later on in your career, but rather the ripple effect um, of your influence is rather much smaller when you are more junior. So um, if you make the wrong call and it doesn't go well, uh, doing it now will be much, much easier <laughs> than if you were uh, like 20 years and you're some kind of director, uh, the number of people you impact are significantly more different. So uh, everything when you're young is a learning and growing opportunity, so uh, take it when you see one. Uh, next up is uh, finding your community. So uh, it's really easy to find your community when you are a student and you're forced to be with the same people for five days a week, uh, nine hours a day. But it is a little bit harder when you graduate. So firstly, at work, uh, some venues to think about uh, would be maybe people with similar hobbies and yes, speaking of hobbies, now it's a great time to get one. Um, potential DEI groups. So, you know, I think uh, life gives everyone a bag of lemons, but depending on who you are, uh, the bag of lemons is slightly different. So it's really great to be able to have a community of people who kind of understand your perspective and know the hardships you're going through uh, for, to be there with you when you do need that support. And lastly, uh, don't underestimate team events, um, especially for my introverts out here in this room. I know that um, it doesn't feel necessary to do them, but uh, at the end of the day, you're working with people, and the more you get to know someone, the easier the communication gets. The more trust you build, the easier your work will be. So it is important to uh, try going to them. So now, some of you might be thinking, well, my company doesn't have any hobby groups, we don't have any DEI groups, uh, our, my team doesn't event, do any events. If only someone started them. Well, it could be you. Um, so I think you would be surprised by if you decide to just like start something like a game night or a after work social, how many people are craving that. So if you're sitting there thinking, I wish we had one of these events, chances are a lot of people in your team or your company are also thinking it. And especially after COVID, I think everyone is just a little desperate for social interactions and finding connections. So uh, some easy ideas are uh, playing games together. There's a lot of great online games like Scribble.io, uh, Galactic Phone, things like that. Uh, you could book something over lunch. You could do something after work. Uh, sometimes you could even ask your manager uh, if it'd be okay to maybe just take the last 30 minutes of a Thursday to do some team building social activity. Uh, usually they would probably say yes. In terms of staying active in the industry and community, um, you can go to meetups. So I guess this kind of counts as a meetup. So congrats, you're already at one. Um, good job. You could go to hackathons and game jams. And before you dismiss this idea, um, what if I told you you could do hackathons without killing yourself? Because it's possible. I do hackathons and game jams three times a year. And the way I do it is, uh, first you have to find other people who are also uh, down to just kind of do a more chill one. Um, you kind of set strictly your, 
work hours, if that makes sense. And it doesn't have to be nine to five and not everyone's work hours have to be the same. Um, and you can make it very clear upfront where your commitment is. So, you know, if you want to not be there for Saturday morning because you want to go play squash or you have to go pick up someone at the end of Sunday, um, as long as you communicate at upfront, I've had many successful game jams where you commit to an idea that could be developed in one day and the other ones just were polished and everyone just does like eight or nine hours of work and you're still able to have a weekend. Um, I really think hackathons and game jams are a great way to kind of stay uh, connected to the people in the community and it's really fun as well. It really invigorates your creativity and uh, inspires you. Oh, whoops, I skipped the point. Okay, and, um, and if you want to start an event, by the way, um, and it seems kind of daunting because one of the hardest things to find is a venue, um, always try asking your company because for professional events, uh, it really is marketing and free exposure for your company. So a lot of companies would be willing to give the space to allow you to do that if you want to start something. Uh, and lastly is mentorships. So uh, you could be a mentor and you could find a mentor. I think it's valuable to uh, sign up for mentorship programs out there. There's a lot and they're always looking for mentors to help out. Um, being a mentor is great because it reaffirms you what you already know. It's a great way to give back to the community. Um, and I think a lot of people hesitate to sign up to be mentors because you're like, well, I don't have like 10 years of experience, but I think you do have valuable perspective. Um, for example, how to find a job during COVID, that's not something uh, someone who has 10 years of experience can provide other people. So there's that. Uh, and in terms of finding mentors, uh, I think people don't realize how common it is for everyone at all stages of their career to have mentors. Sometimes they might not call them mentors, but honestly, everyone has a mentor. The director as your company probably has a mentor. So it's never too late to find one. Personally for me, what has worked really well is just messaging people, being like, hey, I saw you do this talk, or I saw you do this, and I thought it was really cool. Could I have 30 minutes of your time to just do a quick call? People usually have not said no to me yet, because I think everyone has 30 minutes to spare. So it's a great way to kind of kick it off. You don't have to find mentors through mentorship programs. Uh, anyone could be your mentor. So, one-on-ones. <clears throat> uh, um, no one teaches you how to do them, uh, and you really, really realize very quickly how important they are. So make sure you are scheduling reoccurring one-on-ones with your managers and, in my opinion, your coworkers. So people who work very closely with you where a lot of your stuff overlaps, uh, it's very, very important that you have a space for you guys to kind of discuss, talk about how work is going, um, if there's any roadblocks, et cetera, et cetera. And it doesn't have to be like this big chunk of time, it could just be like 15 minutes every two weeks if you want it to be really casual. But having that space to have these discussions are really important. I have found out so many things through these one-on-ones that I would not have if I didn't have them. And in terms of one-on-ones with your manager, uh, <clears throat> sorry, make sure that it is happening at a cadence that is comfortable for you. So depending on your manager's style, some people prefer uh, shorter cadences and some people prefer longer ones. And some managers don't book one-on-ones with you at all, so those you gotta really make sure you're taking the initiative uh, to book them. And if, say, they prefer to do it once a month, but you feel like you need a little bit more guidance for that, remember that the one-on-one -on -one is not for them, it's for you. It's a great space for you to ask questions, for you to report your progress to them, for them to see what you're doing, as well as uh, for them to give you mentorship. So. And once in a while, it's great to ask, hey, how do you think I'm doing? Uh, is there anything I can improve on? And this question to me, uh, I take it the same way as um, when you ask someone, how are you? How's your day going? Because most people's program 
initial response is, oh, I'm doing fine, everything's good, how about you, right? So usually I find out when you ask this question, you need to ask it a couple of times before you can actually get a real answer. So if the person didn't already have something off the top of their head that they've been like trying to tell you, um, usually they'll just say good. And you can find ways to basically ask the same question multiple times until you kind of uh, guide them to an answer. So you can be like, hey, um, how did I do? Uh, last week in our presentation, or what do you think about my work so far on this specific thing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, people generally do have feedback for you, you just need to kind of get it out of them. Uh, the next one is don't be ashamed of your dreams and goals, whether they are big or small. So um, if you just want to chill, or if you want to be a CEO one day, either way, uh, communicating your goals to your manager and your colleagues is really important because if they don't know what you want, they can't help you. Um, and I think a lot of people, especially early in their career, if you have like lofty goals, it feels like it's not really necessary to talk about it now because you know you're just a junior. Do you really need to talk about how you want to be a CEO one day? But uh, if the more people you tell, the more eyes you have out there, and when people uh, know who you are and what you want, they will be additional eyes on the ground to look for opportunities for you, and they will refer you when something comes up, et cetera, et cetera, so. And lastly, uh, keep notes and records. So uh, there are a very rare breed of people who actually like taking notes. So if you're not one of them, it's usually not very organic for you to take notes uh, in meetings. But I think taking notes and keeping a record for one-on-ones specifically is really, really important. Um, because I can't tell you the amount of times that the memory just fails you. <laughs> you had a conversation with someone uh, and neither of you remember what the conclusion was. But if you had the notes, it clears it right up. There's no confusion. No one needs to accidentally gaslight anyone. Uh, it's great. It also keeps uh, important progress of, sorry, the important record of your progress. So especially on your one-on-ones with your manager, it keeps, it's essentially a documentation of how you've been doing, what discussions you've had, et cetera, et cetera. And lastly, it does protect you in case something unpleasant happens, but hopefully you don't need to do it for that, um, but yeah. So lastly, uh, creating sustainable systems and rhythms for yourself. Once you have a goal, uh, it's really important to break it down into actual achievable tasks. I think it's fun to be like, oh, I have this passion project, I wanna make this app, I wanna make this game. But having that kind of lofty end goal uh, is quite unachievable if you don't actually break it down into doable tasks. And uh, the same way as you how the same way as how you would break a Jira down <laughs> into achievable tasks that can be done in sprints, you should do that for your personal goals as well. It's also important, I think, to break one, a part of it into something that will only take you 10 to 30 minutes, that is easily repeatable um, to be able to slot into your calendar at any time. Because that way you can create a system that will move you towards what you want to do without thinking about it. I think a lot of people uh, tend to rely on motivation and your drive to keep things going, keep things moving, but the truth is you're not gonna be motivated 24 seven. There's gonna be some days where you're not feeling it or some weeks or some months, but if you have the small thing that is slowly inching you towards your goal, uh, that it's just scheduled, so it's a routine, it's a habit, uh, it allows you to kind of slowly move towards it without relying solely on how motivated you feel that day. Uh, and thirdly, be careful not to burn out. So uh, I know I just told you a bunch of things that you should be doing, you or could be doing um, extracurricularly, but it's also important to slow down and remember to enjoy life. Um, I personally believe that most students who graduate are on the verge of burnout. <laughs> And that's because uh, if you think about it, you know, you do essentially a nine to five and just classes alone. 
but you can't clock out at five. You have to do your homework, you have to apply for things, you have to work in your portfolio, you have to have a side project, you have to go to every networking event possible to meet people. It's a lot, you basically can never turn it off. So it's no wonder that a lot of students are suffering de with depression or um, on the verge of burnout. So I've seen so many people I know who graduated and tried to keep the momentum up um, without recognizing that they are basically on the verge of burnout and fell into really bad burnout. So uh, for once in your life, you have you are able to clock out after five. It's really a privilege. So uh, take advantage of that privilege. Find a hobby. Find some friends. You know, uh, go to the park in Montreal. It's the weather is very lovely these days. And if you do burn out, uh, it's all right. <laughs> um, I think something that people don't realize is that burnout is not really like a yes, no, Boolean check mark. Uh, burnout has many, many stages. Um, as my therapist said, burnout has a lot of symptoms that are the same as mild depression. So burnout is not like you hit burnout and that's it, it can't get worse. It could get way worse. <laughs> so the earlier you catch it in yourself, uh, the easier it will be for you to recover because the effort to recover gets exponentially harder the more you are burnt out. And there's a lot of material out there on you know, signs of burnout. Uh, you can Google many, many articles about it. So just educate yourself on what the signs are so you can recognize it not only in yourself, but importantly in other people as well. Um, and if you do burn out, my personal experience with it was that I think a big mistake I made was trying too hard <laughs> to recover. So you feel, you wake up one day and you feel like you have a little bit of motivation and you're so eager to be like, oh, I'm cured, I'm not burned out anymore. And you want to use all of that and it ends up just depleting you and draining you. And it's really a one step forward, two step back thing. So I like to think of it as a, a stamina bar, like the kind you have in video games, uh, where if you uh, run, it depletes and you have to wait for it to refill. Um, you wouldn't try it running again after it's only it's still in the red and just refilled a little bit. Usually the general rule is you wait until it's like 70 to 100% full, then you do it again. So yeah, if you do burn out, be patient with yourself and allow yourself to heal. So that's about it. The TLDR is that the main quest has started. Um, you can start initiatives based on your observations, believe in yourself and allow yourself these opportunities to learn and grow. To find your own community at work as well as in the industry, mentor and start your own events if nobody is doing it. Schedule reoccurring one-on-ones with your manager and coworkers, ask for clear feedback, be loud about your dreams and goals, and document everything. Lastly, break your goals into small achievable tasks that can be scheduled into your life in a very sustainable way. Uh, watch out for it. burnout in yourself and others. Thank you for listening.